right. Good afternoon. Welcome to the 2024 Horse Management Webinar. This is our second webinar in this series of four. And so these are hosted by NDSU Extension. And today our topic is prevention and detection of communicable equine diseases. And so with us today, our speakers are going to be Paige Brummond. Paige is our extension agent in Ward County for Ag and Natural Resources. Uh, and Paige is one of the active members of this webinar team. We also have with us Dr. Quinn Steichen. Uh, Quinn is the veterinary pathology resident at the NDSU Veterinary Diagnostic Lab. And so we're really excited to have both of them talking to us today uh, about communicable diseases. Just a side note, this is being recorded and it will be sent to you. And so um, you, you don't have to take notes furiously. You can always go back and watch the recording. So today we're gonna to talk just a little bit about what is a communicable disease? What, what does that mean? Uh, we're gonna talk about biosecurity and prevention. And, and then of course, how do we detect those diseases that we're talking about? And so with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Paige and she's gonna get us kicked off. Thank you, Mary. So first up, what is a communicable disease? So any infectious disease that is transmissible from horse to horse fits into this category. And it's a problem because these type of diseases spread rapidly between horses versus something like a, a genetic condition that's limited to, to an individual horse. These are contagious. They spread rapidly amongst your horses in your facility um, and any horses that come in contact. So some of the examples that we're gonna talk about today, we, we did just an informal poll to some equine veterinarians in North Dakota, and they kind of highlighted these as some of them that they're concerned with and that they're treating um, regularly or more regularly. So the examples, and we'll visit about these later, are gonna be equine herpes virus, equine influenza, strangles, which some people know as distemper or strep, and then some skin conditions as well, things like uh, you know ringworm, a fungal infection, girth itch, pastern dermatitis. Some people refer to that as as scratches. So how are these diseases spread? And each disease spreads maybe a little bit differently, and it's important to to know that. So let's talk about just in general. These diseases can potentially be spread by aerosol droplets or airborne droplets. So a horse that is, is coughing, sneezing, breathing, and those droplets are transmitted through the air to land on a surface or come in contact with another horse's airway. Contact spread is another one, and that's that's nose-to-nose -nose contact. So them actually uh, touching each other or body-to-body or -body contact. Another way is through ingestion. So um, being exposed to those pathogens through a shared water source or, or a shared feed source. Vectors will spread these diseases occasionally, depending upon the disease again, but we have things like insects. So think flies, mosquitoes, ticks, rodents like skunks and mice and rats, birds, all sorts of birds transmitting um, different pathogens and other wildlife as well. And then lastly, a, a term to know is fomites. And that's an object or an item that is transmitting this pathogen between horses. Um, so think of brushes. If you brush a horse with a fungal ring, ringworm infection and then go brush a horse without it, pretty soon that second horse has ringworm as well. So brushes, buckets, sharing buckets amongst horses. Uh, rags, contaminated clothing that a human is wearing. So just the human themselves on their hands and their clothing, um, trailers, and, and many, many more fomites. Anything that can have this pathogen come in contact with it can act as a fomite and spread it to another animal. So what do we do about it? Okay, so first let's kind of define biosecurity. And that's the act of limiting your exposure to disease by implementing these procedures to minimize the spread of pathogen. And I, uh, I really wanna emphasize that it's a risk reduction, not 100%. So we, we would strive for our horses to never get exposed to these or never get sick from exposure and never transmit it. But through our biosecurity practices, we try to limit that and reduce the risk and minimize that spread. 
it's not going to be a hundred percent. So I do want to um, just stress that right there. Very important to implement our biosecurity and prevention plans. As far as prevention goes, um, first of all, have a healthy horse. So uh, that's going to help you out just as much as anything. So have that balanced ration, a healthy horse that's living in a low stress environment or as low as stress that we can provide to our livestock. Secondly, for prevention, make sure your horses are current on the recommended vaccinations to boost their immunity. So when they are exposed, they do have higher levels of immunity through those vaccinations you administered. And then also be aware of the common diseases and how they're spread. That will help you become uh, more biosecure and develop that plan and, and prevent the spread. So an example is, you know, influenza being spread through the air and aerosol droplets uh, versus something like girthage. If you go put a horse, you know, a stall or two down and think that I'm, I'm good, this horse has influenza, but two stalls down, I'll keep my other horses away. Know that those pathogens are going to spread through the air and still expose the other horses in your barn. Versus something like girthage that's more contact or can be transmitted through fomites. If you're really good with your biosecurity plan, just because one horse in your facility um, ends up with that condition doesn't mean that um, it will automatically spread. So knowing and being aware of what the diseases are and how they're spread will really help you tighten up your biosecurity plan. We're gonna to touch briefly on vaccination, not extensively. We want you to work with your local veterinarians um, to determine what's right for you and your horses, but know that the um, there are guidelines out there that all horses should have the core vaccines. And these are recommended because if a horse contracts these disease, they have high mortality rates. So those that are considered core vaccines are the uh, vaccines against West Nile virus, Eastern and Western encephalitis, tetanus and rabies. So that's regardless of, of what you do with your horse or where it goes or what your situation is. Those are the recommended core vaccines. And then there's many, many, many more that are risk-based. And you'll notice that the risk-based vaccines are some of those that we're going to talk about today because they were highlighted as a, as a concern or something that is treated regularly in the North Dakota horse population. So the, those risk-based ones um, include equine herpes virus, influenza, strangles, and then there's many, many more. So again, we want you to encourage uh, you to visit with your attending veterinarian to determine which one of those uh, or which ones of the risk-based vaccines might be right for you. And if you wanna do a little bit of research ahead of time, uh, we recommend you utilize some of the sources that we'll, we'll link that will allow you to do some research and ask the questions of your veterinarian. So let's go back to protecting your herd, your herd that exists at home or your horses that exist at home. One of the key things to consider is quarantine any new horses that you purchase or you bring in as a, a boarding operation or a friend's horse. Um, and also quarantine any horses of your own that are traveling and coming back to your established herd. So quarantine is keeping them separated. Avoiding that nose-to-nose -nose contact with resident horses. And ideally, it should be, you know, there's different ideas on how far away they need to be kept. Not everybody has an option to, to keep them super far apart, but if they're only 10 feet apart, that's not quarantining. So we recommend at least 120 feet for a new horse. And even though that, that there still is going to be some aerosol um, risk included with horses that close. So that as fur further away that you can get them is best. As far as how long, uh, 14 to 28 days is recommended and know that this is all risk-based too. So the longer that you can keep horses quarantined from another, the less risk you're going to have of spreading a disease. You're allowing that new horse on the place to um, determine if they are healthy and usually after 28 days, um, that risk is much, much reduced and you can introduce them to your herd. The other thing to keep in mind is that keeping those new horses away from common areas that your established herd uses. So this includes the wash rack, the wall where you tie all the horses to a saddle, cross ties, shared turnout areas. So if you have a round pen or arena that you turn out horses in, um, you can do your best to have them stalled or housed away from each other. But if you bring that horse into that shared common area, 
all that hard work kind of goes out the door. Same goes for the care items that you use. So have a separate set of tack, grooming, manure forks. If it's not possible or feasible for, for you to do that, use those items last on your new horse and disinfect, clean and disinfect in between use. The other recommendation is gonna to be to monitor the vital signs of that horse daily. And ideally make sure that you're documenting temperature at least once a day, twice a day is even better. And again, handle that new horse or that quarantine horse last. If it's not possible to handle it last after you've already did your chores and worked with your established horses, if you do have to handle that new horse first, make sure that you wash hands or even better wash hands and change clothes before going to your established herd. The other thing to keep in mind is what's the history of that new animal? Um, and that might increase or decrease your risk as well. So was that animal recently at a sale event or purchased through um, an event or a facility where there are hundreds of horses commingled together from all over the state or the country? Or was it a private treaty purchase where maybe that horse came from a closed herd, only a couple animals that hadn't been off the farm in months? That's gonna determine um, the level of risk and that might help you determine how long you're gonna quarantine and, and so on. Also knowing the travel history of the horse. So say you did purchase a horse from a small operation um, and they only had a few there and that horse had not left the place in you know a year or longer. However, if the other horse in that herd was traveling weekly, that kind of negates the, the closed herd idea, okay? So know the travel history of the horse and where it came from. Next, let, let's talk about while transfer, transporting your horse or while on the road. You know, cleaning your trailer after, after each use just sounds like common sense, right? But, but cleaning the trailer after every time you use it, clean out the, the manure, let it dry um, completely. The thing that we maybe aren't as good about is deep cleaning and disinfecting regularly. And regularly is going to be different for, for every person, right? Do you haul your horses um, once a year? Maybe you're only going to clean and disinfect once a year. Um, if you're hauling them multiple times a day or week, it, it becomes more important to deep clean and disinfect regularly. Maybe you need to be doing this um, every week, every other week, monthly, if you're hauling a lot of different horses together. And when we say deep clean, we mean um, take out the mats, scrub all the walls with soap and water from top to bottom, rinse it out, allow it to dry, and then in disinfect all the surfaces. We wanna do that both on the inside and the outside. The other thing to keep in mind that hauling is stressful for horses and stress affects their immune response. So we do wanna make sure that they're up to date on their vaccinations and, and give them a booster if, if needed. Um, Something we do want to point out, though, is that, you know, vaccinating your horse the day that you're leaving or a couple days before you leave isn't recommended. And you want to give them a booster um, at least a couple months to allow them to develop that immune response. When you're hauling off-farm horses or sharing rides with other horses, this, this happens all the time, right? You know, you're trying to save on mileage, um, offer a friend a ride, share your health requirements. You know, do you require certain vaccinations? Do you require certain paperwork? That, that's also the law to travel in some states or across borders. But make sure that you, you visit with whatever uh, the owner of whatever horse you're hauling and make sure you're just on the same page about what your expectations are. Inspect that horse before you load them. Make sure that they, they visibly appear healthy. Um, taking their temperature is also a, a recommendation. The next thing you can do to help yourself off and, and minimize risk of exposure is to keep as much space as possible between horses. So in this picture, maybe instead of putting these horses right next to each other in the trailer, leave an empty stall or a gap between them. Don't allow the bars down on the window so they can stick their head out and, and touch noses. Have a solid divider between them again so they can't touch noses. Keep as much space as possible when transporting if it's possible. And how about when you're away from home? So you're at your event, you're at the, the vet clinic, you're at the rodeo, the show, wherever you're going, the trail ride, the branding. Um, know that there's a potential for outbreaks to spread rapidly when we're at group events. We bring many, many horses together from all different places. 
they they co-mingle, they're exposed, and then they go back home, okay? And it spreads rapidly that way. Before you travel, again, inspect your horse, take their vitals, make sure that they're healthy. We don't wanna be hauling a unhealthy horse. Make sure that your vaccinations are current, have that documentation and booster as needed. Once you're at the event, stay separated as best you can. So, you know, if you're going and you're commingling all these horses together under one roof in a barn, um, try to space out. So you're stalling horses uh, with another horse from another barn. If you have a tax stall or a feed stall, put that between your horses. If the the bar that's an open ventilation, if the bars are all down, maybe you can put up a tarp or something to minimize that nose to nose contact. Don't use shared equipment. So even at the shows, as, as much as we want to be friendly or these different events, like, oh, I forgot a water bucket. Can I use yours? Um, try, try not to be too giving of your horse's uh, personal care items. And if you do clean and disinfect between using them for your horse again. So tack, grooming supplies, manure forks, buckets, all of those fomites that can transfer these infectious conditions back and forth. Monitor their health before you leave, but also during the event and after the event, because again, hauling can be stressful, um, taking them to new environments can be stressful. So monitor those vital signs. And then the last thing I'll say is have a kind of a, an awareness of visitor contact. So I think of um, going places where there's going to be people that want to pet your horse, right? So a lot of times they're going to pet your horse and they're going to go right down the barn alley and pet other people's horses. So minimizing that or, or not allowing that is one option. Or if, if you do want to allow that, um, make sure that you are um, requesting that they wash their hands before and after petting your horse to minimize that spread. A few additional considerations to think about is avoiding communal water sources, okay? This is a big thing. You show up somewhere and there's just one big water tank that's full of water that all of the livestock are drinking out of. That's a really quick way to spread diseases. Also, um, you say, well, I'll just go fill up my bucket out of that water source, but then you're taking it back to your horse and that, that water source is contaminated. So minimize or do not dunk the bucket in that tank or the hose in the bucket. So it's best to fill up a bucket out of, directly out of a hydrant or a hose, but don't put that end of the hose into the water because then that hose becomes a fomite that can transfer that pathogen to the next bucket and the next bucket and the next bucket. Combing with the horses is another one. So we think of, well, in the stalls, what can we do to minimize them from touching the horse in the stall next to them? But also when you're, you're out riding, um, don't allow your horse to make nose to nose contact with the horse next to them. And again, the sharing of equipment. So, you know, someone wants to borrow a rag, I just need to wipe my horse's face off real quick. And then you take that rag and wipe your horse's face off and that, that mucus gets transferred between the horses as with um, the pathogens that go with it. So again, all of that sharing of equipment, if you're going to do it, make sure it's clean and disinfected before you use it again. So here it goes back to, um, we talked about biosecurity is reducing the risk, not eliminating it. So know that horses get sick. That is that is a fact of life. They, they're, It's not necessarily if they will, but when they will, if, if you are a horse owner. So how do we handle that sick horse? Well, promptly remove it from the rest of the horse. So if something's not right, your horse spikes a fever because you're checking those vital signs regularly, remove it from the rest of the herd quarantine it, separate it, separate all the items that you use to care with it. So have a separate halter and lead rope, different buckets, different feed pans, different grooming tools, anything that you need to use on a sick horse, you want it to be separate from those that are not sick. Again, treat and care for that sick horse last, just like on the biosecurity and quarantine plan for a horse that may or may not be sick. You want to care for them last on a, a horse that we know is sick. You definitely want to make sure that you're paying attention to that and treating them last. And usually if your vet's coming to treat them, they're very aware. They're, they are very well versed in biosecurity and understand that. But what about your other family members or friends or a farrier that's coming in or another professional that's working on your horse that might not always be at the top of their mind. So just communicating that and saying, hey, um, I want you to work on this horse last. 
If that's not possible for whatever reason, again, change and disinfect your clothing, footwear, wash your hands, do whatever you can to reduce yourself being a fomite to transfer that disease to a healthy horse. And then let's briefly talk a little bit about the disinfecting process. That word is kind of thrown around as, you know, something that we say a lot. We'll just clean it, clean and disinfect. There's a process to it and a correct way to do it. Disinfectants work best on clean surfaces. So the number of times that, you know, I've gone somewhere and I can smell the bleach or watch somebody um, using a bleach solution and just spraying it on the, the ground or the dirt or the sand, um, that's not effective. So knowing what works and what doesn't work is, is kind of important. If you're disinfecting an area or a stall, first remove everything from that stall, get rid of the debris, any organic material. So that would be scraping off any dried on manure or uh, mucus that's stuck on the walls. Uh, wash the walls and the floor with a, a soapy detergent. So a, a soap and water mixture from the top to the bottom. Allow that to dry and then apply a disinfectant following the label instructions. It's really important here too that you don't um, just kind of randomly mix dif different products. Um, that can really create some problems with really toxic fumes, uh, can chemical reactions that can heat. Uh, you don't want to experiment with mixing products. On this next slide here, we have just a, a brief chart of the different types of disinfectants out there. And, you know, if you're concerned, you're targeting a specific issue, definitely visit with your veterinarian about what will work for you in that scenario, because there's a variety of them. So, our, our phenols work best in the presence of organic material. Again, the best thing to do is get rid of as much of that organic material as possible. So that again, that's the manure, the mucus, any dirt, uh, soiled areas. Your chlorines, like your bleaches, they're inactivated by organic material. So if you're using those and spraying it directly over top of manure or some dirt on the walls, it's not gonna be effective. Some are inhibited by hard water, so that's good to know. Other ones are inactivated by sunlight or organic material. Think of your, your beta dyes and those solutions that are kept in the dark bottles. There's reasons for that. A very common one that many people use is the Novosan or the chlorhexidine solutions, and those aren't effective against spore forming bacteria. So this is where it kind of comes in hand to know what you're dealing with and working with your veterinarian to find the product that works best for you. Formaldehydes aren't used much for, for the layman. They're extremely toxic. Um, the sulfates are effective against many germs, so those are more common. Um, so just keep in mind that what you're using is going to determine on your individual situation. And always follow those label instructions pretty uh, well, very closely. So it sounds like a lot. We've mentioned a lot of things and you think, well, I'm just going to bubble wrap my horse and, and put them in a, a you know, a, a really safe area and not, not do anything with them because certainly they're going to catch something. Again, it's all about reducing your risk and it's really up to you to make the decision of how strict you need to be. And this might vary depending upon your individual situation and nobody can answer these questions except for you. So are you competing regularly or traveling regularly with this horse? Or is it a pasture companion animal that's in a closed herd that doesn't leave and new horses don't come in and out? Their risk levels are much different and how you manage that risk might be much different. So you can think through the things that we've talked about today and say, does this work for me or not? What's the value of the horse and what's the level of risk that you're willing to accept? And that's a, a question that, that you can only answer yourself. What's the value of lost training or lost competition time or lost use of that horse if it becomes ill? You know, are you willing to, to, to give up use of that horse while it recovers from a, a illness or, or not? Or what if it doesn't recover? That's something to consider as well. And then of course, the, the cost of prevention measures are almost always going to be less than the cost of the treatment if it were to get to get sick. So use those prevention measures that we talked about um, to the best of your ability. And then evaluate those protocols. So every horse facility is unique. You can set up your protocols for your operation. You can require visitors to wash their hands, to go through a foot bath, to do whatever you need to do. Um, 
on your facility. That is completely up to you. And those protocols might change um, depending upon what's going on at your barn or, barn or your farm or ranch at the time. Tailor it to your needs. And we do in our resources have some examples of some very detailed biosecurity plans that you can implement uh, bits and pieces of or the entire thing depending upon your situation. So I'm going to briefly uh, talk about this and then turn it over to uh, Dr. Steichen. So in order to provide surveillance and early detection, you have to know what's normal for your horse. And knowing how to take their vital signs and document their vital signs is, is the key part of this. And probably just as important as knowing what's normal is you need to know what's not normal. Okay. So observe your horses. And if you haven't taken all of their vital signs before, um, I, I definitely recommend learning how, okay? So we wanna make sure that you know how to take their, their temperature is key and just know their normal behavior and expression of your horses. Um, you know, some people can walk in and look at their horse and know instantly without taking their temperature or any of their vital signs that they're not right, they're not feeling well because their behavior is the first, first indication for them, okay? Are they eating, drinking, urinating, defecating normally? Um, evaluate all of those things on a daily basis. Know how to take their temperature and know what's normal for them. Document it, write it down, put it in your calendar, have a chart out, out in the barn to document these vital signs regularly so you have a record of what's normal for your horse. Know to take their pulse, respiration, check their gum color, check their capillary refill times, check their hydration, uh, know what their normal gut sounds are like, um, all of those things are important. If you have a problem, definitely your, your first contact is going to be your local veterinarian. If your horse isn't right, reach out to your attending veterinarian. After that, um, the veterinarian may decide to work with a diagnostic lab, um, or you may work with a diagnostic lab directly. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Steichen and she is going to visit with you about the veterinary diagnostic lab. All right, thank you so much. So that was a great overview on how to prevent infectious diseases in your animals. Um, but as Paige was saying, this is always a risk reduction. So even with the best protocols, there can be a lapse and your animals can get sick. Um, what do you do then? So obviously working with your veterinarian is the first step um, and you, uh, after that, you know, you can work with them in order to get the correct samples. Um, unfortunately, with some of the infectious diseases I will be discussing, uh, they do cause animals to die. And that is really when the diagnostic lab steps in. Um, and so we really ultimately are here to work with you guys as horse owners, extension agents, and referring veterinarians to find out why that animal died. And if it is an infectious disease, how can we help prevent that spread within your herd or to your neighbor's animals? Um, basically, we want to help your animals feel safe and, health and healthy. Um, so here's a picture of our diagnostic lab. We moved over here in 2017 off of the main campus of NDSU. Um, this was a welcome move because we have a giant parking lot now where we can back up trailers and you don't have a bunch of undergrads um, staring at you if you have to drop off samples or an animal. Um, and so just very briefly about the diagnostic lab, if you're unfamiliar with us, there are 22 employees that work here. Um, as Mary said, I am a third year a resident, and I'm trained under two boarded pathologists, Dr. Pecorero, who's our director, and then Dr. Webb. Uh, we also have a boarded toxicologist, a veterinary diagnostician, and then also numerous um, medical technicians, microbiologists, veterinary technicians, and chemists. On an average, the diagnostic lab sees about 14,000 cases every year. Predominantly, we are a cattle a lab, but we also see uh, small animals, so dogs and cats, our equine or horses, and then a scattering of exotic animals uh, from the local zoos. And if you've never been to our uh, lab, I just real quick wanted to post a picture. Uh, so you can see I-29 on the picture off to the left. We are actually west of I-29. If you go past that beef uh, research complex, we are on the left side or the north side of the road. 
We have a huge parking lot where if you're dropping off samples or an animal, um, you can go ahead and park in that client parking off to the right picture, as you can see. And then we have two doors that you can enter. We have two awesome front office staff administrators that can help fill out submission forms, um, as well as collect payments. If for some reason you have samples and you're driving through Fargo at nine o'clock at night, we do have an after hours uh, sample area that you can drop off. Those cooler doors are open 24 seven. Um, so you can drop off samples there as well as fill out a submission form. Now, unfortunately, there are times that we just have to drop off an animal. Um, and so we do have a big hoist system that you can go ahead and back your trailer up. We can uh, take the animal off of a flatbed trailer or your enclosed horse trailer. We do just ask that if you're going to drop off an animal in an enclosed trailer to let us know beforehand. Only reason being is that we have to add in another pulley system to our hoist system and it helps us be prepared for you guys. Um, obviously, dropping off an animal here is always very emotional, um, and we try to be cognizant of that, and we are trying to make sure that you're not waiting on us to get that hoist system together. So we are always here for you. If you have the unfortunate task where you have to drop off an animal to us, just let us know beforehand that it's coming in an enclosed trailer. And so everything I'm gonna talk about, um, you can find on our website, which is posted there. Um, you can also give us a call. That's the front office number. Um, always feel free to call us or just stop by and drop off samples. Like I said, our two front office administrators are wonderful um, and they can definitely help you with any questions that you have or divert you to somebody else in the lab that might be more helpful in answering those questions. So before going into uh, some of the infectious diseases, I just wanted to put a plug in because it is Coggin season. And so the majority of our submissions that come through the VDL is equine infectious anemia or Coggins. And so that is the blood test that you normally always have to pull in order to travel um, to other states or even within some of the uh, events within the state. And so I'm pretty sure that we are the only laboratory in the state of North Dakota that is accredited and certified through USDA to run Coggins. It is an extremely intense process where the USDA actually comes in and in inspects us. And um, our microbiologist, Sharon, has to uh, pull records and keep in-depth equipment logs, temperature logs on everything um, when she runs these Coggins tests. So it's... Um, very important when you submit to us, whether it be you or your veterinarian submitting, um, that we have all the information that you need. Now, your veterinarian does have to be the one to pull blood for a Coggins test. Um, you can submit an electronic form, which is what you see on this seminar. We prefer the electronic form either through Global Vet Link or VSPS. Reason being is A, they're pretty. I love the colored pictures but B, all the information has to be filled out appropriately. If you submit blood on a Wednesday and you need a stat Coggins for a Saturday event and it's on a paper Coggins, if all that information isn't filled out, the USDA won't let us continue on in order to even test that sample. So the electronic form automatically stops when your veterinarian is filling that out and says you need this information. Um, so we do appreciate if you could uh, maybe push your veterinarian into doing electronic copies. Um, about 60% are electronic, but we're still getting about 30 to 40% that are paper. And those are the ones where your veterinarian's coming out and they're drawing on the little submission form, um, all of the colored or white areas. And so besides Coggins, the rest of our case load uh, consists of colic workups, abortions, or our scattered toxin cases. We do also have biopsy service, which, is, which are um, the lumps and bumps that are removed from your horse. Real quick, I just wanted to throw up the submission form, mostly because if you are submitting an animal or um, a sample to us, 
History is so important. You know, Paige really kind of talked about some of that history um, on a biosecure aspect. It's really important if we have an animal here that we know everything that you possibly know. Overshare with us. We would much rather have you overshare and think that it's not important because it might be a key thing that helps us really narrow down our diagnosis here at the laboratory. Um, and so that submission form is seen off to the left-hand side of the screen. On the right hand side is more for our skin workups. We get very rare skin workups um, through the laboratory, but I will briefly touch on that at the very end. Okay, so now moving on to the infectious disease. The first one I'm gonna briefly talk about is equine herpes virus. This is also known as EHB. Now there are a lot of different members in this viral group. But the two main ones that I'm going to talk about today are EHV1 and EHV4. Now, you may be familiar with these two if you've ever read the vaccine insert before, because um, these are in a lot of respiratory vaccines. EHV1 very broadly it causes abortions and neurologic uh, manifestations, while EHV4 causes more of the respiratory. Um, and we'll go into each one of these. So EHV1 is the majority of what we're going to see. It can cause late-term abortions or within the third trimester, and that is really between the 9 to the 11-month range of gestation. When I use the term abortion, I mean that this fetus was exposed from the uterus um, prior to the time of it being alive or viability. Um, that is what the top picture is showing on the screen. Now, if EHV1 doesn't cause an abortion, it can cause either a stillborn or a weak foal. Stillborn means that that foal should have been born alive, but it was actually born dead. And then a weak foal, they almost kind of look like dummy foals. They never really stand. They don't nurse within the appropriate time. And then within a couple hours, even if it's through hospitalization with your referring veterinarian, they just don't do well and they end up passing away. And so I put a picture of what we would see come through on our post floor. And I orientated that bottom picture as to what it would look like in the full in the top picture. So the lungs, which are the big pink things in the middle, would be right underneath the rib cage in that full. And the trachea is headed off to the left hand side. And that is what would be going up your neck. And that leads back into the lungs. And so these lungs are really heavy. They're very firm and they almost have rib impressions because they're full and they're full of fluid. And that's what we see in these fetuses that have EHV1. Another key uh, gross lesion that we see are fibrin casts. So in that trachea, it should be clear. But as you can see with those forceps pulling away, there's a yellow strand in there. That's a fibrin cast. Um, so when we see that, our suspicion that this full actually or this fetus actually had EHV1 increases. Another manifestation of EHV1 is the neurologic manifestation. This is also called equine herpes viral myeloencephalopathy, or EHM. Now, we actually recently diagnosed this on our postmortem floor uh, from a horse in Minnesota in early February. And so um, I actually pulled this bottom snippet um, out of a paper from 2021 um, when in the state of uh, Minnesota, they had two different cases, one of EHM, so the neurologic form of EHV1, but also of triple E, which Paige kind of uh, discussed, which is Eastern equine encephalitis. Both of those are neurologic diseases that was diagnosed at our lab. Um, but getting back to EHV1, so this really affects more pregnant mares and mares that are nursing foals. Common clinical signs include ataxia, so not really being able to walk correctly, a urinary incontinence, and then dog sitting, which is what this uh, picture is showing in this horse. On the post floor, it's really important for that history again, because if you tell us that your horse is maybe neurologic or dog sitting or your veterinarian does, we are actually going to take out that entire spinal cord. That entire spinal cord removal usually takes three to four hours sometimes. We have to do it in a very particular way. And so if we know that your horse has these clinical signs, we're going to spend the time to take it out because what we're looking for are hemorrhages. And that's what that bottom picture is showing. So that bottom picture is a spinal cord and the dark areas are areas of hemorrhage. 
Um, and when we see that, we kind of have a suspicion that, again, this is an EHV-1 case. A less scary uh, equine herpes virus is EHV-4, and this is known as equine rhino pneumonitis virus. This really affects just weanlings and yearlings, and again, this is a respiratory disease. Um, clinical signs are just the nasal discharge that's kind of thick and white. They can sometimes run a fever um, or have inappetence or anorexia. And so let's say your horse does have an upper respiratory infection. What are you going to do? Well, again, work with your veterinarian, but you can collect samples such as a nasal swab and submit it to our lab to run some diagnostic tests um, to tell if it is EHV or not. And so the nasal swab is something that you really have to shove pretty far up uh, the nose of that horse. Um, and it has to be a a specific swab. It has to be synthetic. We really don't like those cotton tip swabs. Um, and so you can submit two of those. Uh, the PCR for EHV-1 and 4 is $45. Um, but if you don't know if your horse has equine herpes virus or just in general a respiratory disease, you can run our panel, which has PCR for equine herpes virus 1 and 4, influenza, and an aerobic culture, which will be important for strengths. And again, the costs on uh, this slide do not include our general accession fee, and that is just tacked on to uh, it, the cases, not the individual specimens. So if you have a question about costs or your cost concern, please just call and let us know. Now, moving on to equine influenza, this is one of the most important causes of viral respiratory disease in horses. Uh, clinical signs can include that really white, thick discharge, conjunctivitis, so inflammation around the eyes, reddening of the nasal mucosa, cough, or decreased appetite. The really good thing is that mortality is pretty rare, so the death rate is rare, but it is very contagious. Um, when I was doing some research for this seminar, I believe on the equine practitioners page, I found that if a horse sneezes or coughs, it can travel up to 50 yards to infect another horse. Again, these samples um, are pretty similar to equine herpes virus because it's an upper, upper respiratory and it's a virus. So nasal swab is gonna be your best bet uh, for having a diagnosis. We have a PCR for, e for influenza A, or we can run that uh, respiratory panel. Now moving on to equine strangles. Um, this is the first bacteria. The other two were viruses and now we're moving into a bacteria. And this bacteria is actually called Streptococcus equi, subspecies equi. Um, and it's really called strangles because the horse kind of makes a strangled breathing sound um, because of all of the nasal discharge, but then also the uh, swelling that happens around the neck. And the reason that they're swelling is because that bacteria loves lymph nodes. And so that top picture is actually showing some lymph nodes down underneath the jaw or the throat latch area. And it goes to those, it, the bacteria goes to those lymph nodes and they become abscessed. And once they become abscessed, then they rupture. And that's what that picture is showing. That rupturing of those lymph nodes and that drainage is very infectious to another animal. Um, and so that's usually how transmission happens. Clinical signs uh, of equine strangles um, is fever, inflammation around that throat area, respiratory strider, like I said previously, enlarged and abscessed lymph nodes, nasal discharge, or guttural pouch and pyema. This is unique in the fact that horses have a guttural pouch, which is basically like an auditory tube. Um, there's a lot of important nerves and blood vessels that run through it. And this bacteria loves to go to that guttural pouch and it sits in there. And when it sits, it becomes hard and almost kind of like ma a mass. And these horses that have a really prolonged shedding of equine strangles, it's usually because that bacteria is sitting in that guttural pouch and it's harder to get rid of. Um, so that's just something that you might run into if your uh, horse does come down with this, if they're talking about that, that can be a sequela or something else that happens because of equine strangles. The other uh, thing I wanted to discuss real quick was just metastatic. And this is what happens when the bacteria goes to lymph nodes outside of that 
uh, head area. So in the chest or in the abdominal or belly cavity, um, there's lymph nodes all throughout our body. And so the bacteria likes to go there. We call that metastatic or bastard strangles. The good news is, is that if uh, this uh, bacteria is identified and then treated appropriately, most animals recover just fine. And so the because it's bacteria, uh, we can actually try to culture this. And that is actually what the plate, uh, the culture plate on the right hand side is showing. And this is a culture plate from our diagnostic laboratory of equine strangles. And so we can, our microbiologists can use that nasal swab or an aspirate and they streak it on a plate like you see. This plate is a blood auger plate, so that's why it's red. Um, and then off to the left hand side of that plate are little tiny dip dots. And those are the colonies of bacteria. And so they take those colonies and they put it on a machine that then further isolates it for diagnosis. Um, if you want to run an aerobic culture of a nasal swab, it's gonna be about $32. And again, we can always do that equine respiratory panel if you're unsure what uh, is causing those uh, respiratory lesions, whether it's a virus or bacteria. Sometimes we can do a PCR for equine strangles, uh, we actually don't have that PCR available at our diagnostic laboratory, but we can always refer out and send it to a different laboratory if that's something that you guys want. And lastly, just skin issues. You know, I don't see a lot of skin issues because it comes through more so on our microbiology department. Um, if I see any skin issues in horses, a lot of the times it's gonna be biopsies. And so those are the lumps and bumps that are removed. Some of the common lumps and bumps that we see from horses in this area are sarcoids um, or squamous cell carcinoma. So cancer eye around the eyes of white face horses. Um, and so, a lot of the times, if you're worried about a fungal infections like a ringworm, um, we're going to have you go through our, micro our microbiology department and you're going to run a fungal culture. Uh, you can pull hair or use a brush um, and we can run that fungal culture. Sometimes that culture can take up to three, four weeks um, in order for particularly ringworm to grow. And so a lot of people don't really want to wait that long. I don't blame you. And so we do offer a, a dermatophyte or ringworm PCR. And so uh, the difference between just the fungal culture and PCR, A, cost, B, time, um, C would be that PCR, we really want a hair or a scab. We don't want a brush um, that you can submit for fungal culture. And I see more people submit for fungal culture if they don't know what kind of fungus um, they're looking for, if they're not looking specifically for ringworm. If we are looking specifically for ringworm, um, then we sometimes will have people just do that PCR. Okay, very good. Oh, there I am. Okay, very good. So thank you guys so much for presenting. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna wrap up a couple things here. And so this is what I heard while I was listening today. So I heard biosecurity. Biosecurity is one of your first lines of defenses. And that's true no matter what kind of production system we're in or what kind of um, animals we have, cats, horses, cows, doesn't matter. Biosecurity is your first line of defense. Um, and then limiting exposure. And so through biosecurity, we can limit exposure to what our animals are, are up against. Um, I heard Dr. Steichen say, overshare with your veterinarian and the VDL. And so whatever diagnostic lab you choose to send this to, whatever veterinarian you're working with, whomever you're calling to share information with about questions you have, overshare. Tell them all the things, tell them the long story. OK, because there might be something in there that you think is insignificant that really helps them determine what's going on. And then um, working with whatever veterinary diagnostic lab you choose or if that's a, a local vet, whoever you choose to work with, whether that's a local one or uh, calling NDSUs as well, um, just making sure that you feel comfortable to call them. Always call and ask the question. Never hurts to ask the question. OK. And so with that, we did have a few questions. And so um, Dr. Steichen, we'll have you come back on uh, and Paige is still here. And so we'll just run through some questions quick. And then if anyone else has questions, we can um, make sure those get answered as well. So 
let's start uh, at the top here. Um, and so uh, Paige did answer a few of these in the chat, um, or she referred uh, folks to some, but we're just going to go over them so everybody kind of knows what was going on in the background while you were listening. And so um, one participant says, I have a mini Mustang. Uh, in the spring, he pulls his own hair out. Um, I've treated him for lice and I've washed him with medicated shampoo. The other horses don't seem to have it. Any ideas here? And so uh, we're not necessarily here to diagnose, but are there any just things that come to mind, Dr. Steichen, or things that you would maybe suggest for this person? Yeah, so we actually had a similar uh, case presented to us um, a week or two ago. Um, it sounds like when horses start to maybe pull out their hair, they might be a little itchy. And so that's really something that's important to maybe talk to your veterinarian about. We actually ended up getting some biopsies from a horse. Um, it wasn't a mini, um, but it was just honestly seasonal seasonal shedding, which might not be the case in this particular uh, case. However, again, it could be a lot of different things. And so um, it's really important. My next diagnostic recommendation would have potentially a veterinarian out maybe take some skin biopsies and have us look at them to see if there's anything, you know, we can see bugs on our slides for histopath. Um, and so that would probably be the next steps. Uh, the next question then is, do all horses need to be vaccinated against uh, EEE -E -E and WEE? -E? Or is it based on your location uh, in the county? And so Paige, yep, go ahead. Yeah, so I can I can take that. And, and yes, it is recommended that all horses, regardless of whether they're east or west of the Mississippi, um, be vaccinated for both E and we. And the good news is, is that it is combined into a single vaccination. Uh, most of the products that are out there, it's, it's one vaccine that will vaccinate and provide protection against both of those eastern and western encephalitis. Okay, very good. Um, Dr. Steichen, so the question, and I, I'm going to let you take this one. I think I know half the answer, but I'm curious about the rest of the answer. And so um, does NDSU offer carcass disposal? And so my knee-jerk reaction to that is no, uh, we don't. But what happens if they bring a carcass or a, a something in for diagnostics? What happens then? Yeah, for sure. And and your knee jerk reaction is correct. Uh, we do not just do a straight carcass disposal, unfortunately. Um, if you want to bring your animal in for a autopsy or necropsy, you can use those words interchangeable. Uh, we will then dispose of the animal. Uh, we have a giant incinerator here. We also do offer private cremations for our large animals if you are having an autopsy or necropsy done, I believe. I also believe if you would just like to have a private cremation done, we will do that without doing an autopsy or a necropsy. Again, if that is something on um, that last little bit uh, you have questions about, always feel free to just give us a call and ask that front office. Okay, very good. Let's see, was there any that I missed? Yes. Um, okay, so can you speak to the period of time horses who have had strangles are immune from contracting it again? That would be better directed at more of a clinical veterinarian because there is a lot of gray issue, I feel like, in that um, depending on whether or not they're harboring that, if they've had treatment, if they've ever had vac uh, vaccines before. So that might be more directed at somebody that's a practicing clinical veterinarian instead of on my end. Okay. And so, uh, Lisa, um, you heard that. And so maybe that's something that you can go to your local vet uh, and discuss with them. Let's see. Okay, I have a horse that will show a false positive with a quick version of Coggins, uh, but will show a negative with the alternate test. Can you speak to what may cause that?
no, I cannot. Um, that might be a question more directed towards our serology department. Um, again, I just wanted to briefly bring up Coggins. Um, but if that is a question, I would feel free to go ahead and give us a call and ask to speak to somebody in the serology department, especially if it's through our lab that you're doing it. Um, and then we would probably reroute you to Dr. Pecorero because she is the section head of serology. Um, and she would be able to explain that a little bit more. There's a lot of different tests out there. Um, I'm familiar with what we run, but I'm unfamiliar with some of the other ones. Okay, thank you for that. And and P folks, just know whether it's it's our lab um, or other labs that you're calling, when Dr. Sykin says call us, they really do mean call us. Um, they have their they have experts and, and she listed some of them up front. Their team is exceptional and they are here for the folks that have animals. They want to answer your questions. They want to know what's going on uh, because the only way they get better and they change their tests and they know what to do is to know what's going on out in the, the animal world. And so please do feel free to call uh, those labs. Okay. And, and real okay. quick, Mary, just to put on that, you know, we are one of the smallest diagnostic labs um, out there and we are very easy to get a hold of. I've heard of some of the other diagnostic labs that can be very challenging to speak with pathologist or a toxicologist. And you, most of the time, Dr. Mostrom, our toxicologist will call you and ask you questions and have a conversation. Um, the great thing is, uh, is our veterinary diagnostician, Dr. Mitchell, uh, practiced for a very long time. And so she's awesome to always call and ask questions about because she's also been practicing, but now she's in the diagnostic field as well. Um, so always please just give us a call and ask us the questions. If you're hesitant or you're confused about something, that's what we're here for. Okay, very good. Anything else that came in here? Let's check. I did see one more in the chat, Mary. Oh, okay. Okay, so Diane says, uh, we have a mare that I suspect may be pregnant, even though she uh, ultrasounded as open. She'd be coming into her ninth month and would have missed her five and seven month uh, pneumobort. It would still be beneficial to give her a nine month vaccination, correct? I feel like that one probably has to go back to your local vet and who you're working with. Dr. Steichen? Correct. Every situation is different. And I think Paige kind of, you know, um, did an excellent job with saying that you have to make decisions best on your farm and your operation. And working with your local veterinarian is also going to help in that aspect. Yeah, and just to add to that, it, it's, I mean, ideally, you'd want to confirm that she is pregnant if that's what you're thinking so that you can manage her differently for for nutrition and for housing and all those other things that go with it um but if if that's not possible know that um uh you are correct that giving the nine month vaccine even though you missed the the five and seventh month recommendation would still be acceptable okay so we'll be back here next week um at the same time so wednesday at noon central time. And we'll be talking about um, first aid until a veterinarian arrives. So what do we do in an emergency situation when our animals uh, do something they're not supposed to do? So with that, thank you guys so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Have a great week. Mm -hmm.